and you could, you know, and as a technician, we don't do that very often. Um, <laughs> but you, you could just feel that this, this piece coming. These people were, these people were coming alive because, because it's, it's real. I mean, it's not scripted, it's, it's actually real. Anyway, um, I hope you can sometime drag that thing out of the CBC vaults. There is a, yeah. we, did, we did a CBC special on it, but they yeah. still have it and yeah. we can't get it. Anyway, <clears throat> if you get a chance to, to read the book, it's, it's a fabulous read. <laughs> I'll, I'll just, um, I just wanted to elucidate a little bit the, uh, the audition process for, for me for, uh, oh, stand up. Sorry. <laughs> what actors hate to do is stand up. You know. <laughs> the audition process for me in 1972, because George would put together a company that would last for maybe three or four years. Uh, people would get really fed up with him. He would get fed up with them. They would argue, storm out, not show up for rehearsal, and he would say, fine, that's it. The company's dissolved. And a couple of months later, he would start auditioning for a brand new company. And so I was one of probably about three or 400 people who auditioned for the, uh, for the company he was forming in the summer of 1972. And out of that, he chose 40 people. And... Uh, uh, for the first week, he, he split those 40 people into two groups of 20. So Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, he had one group of 20, and Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, the second group of, of 20. <clears throat> and, and on each of those days, he put us through training, exercises, little tests, physical stuff, singing, whatever it was. At the end of the day on Saturday, he had everybody, the 40 people together, and he read, read off 20 names. So 20 people left. It was, it's kind of like Idol, I suppose. A little bit. <laughs> and the, the 20 people who were left, as Maya said, we auditioned for five weeks, five days a week from 9 in the morning until 6 o'clock at night. We weren't paying anything, and we weren't getting paid at all for this. But at the end of each day, our names would change position on the list that George oh, held. Oh. Now, this wasn't something that we saw. This wasn't something that we saw. That we didn't see the list. But we knew perfectly well that depending upon how well we had done that day, we were, we were changing position. At the end of the five weeks, and, and actually, uh, Maya's husband, Jeff Bronstein, and Barry Wassman were the two uh, people who were returning from the previous company who were there to sort of like uh, aid and abet the, uh, the training process. So we'd sort of like get a little bit of information from them about you know, how we had done or little suggestions as to you know, where we might get improvement. Anyway, at the end of the five weeks, he called us together and uh, he chose eight people uh, for his company. And I was fortunate enough to be one of those eight people. But that was a, it was a pretty grueling process, but it was also a process that taught you an enormous amount stuff that you couldn't, well, Maya has, has already said that. What else did I want to talk about? Um, we are, yeah, let me see. Um, uh, I, I do want to say there were some brilliant, brilliant uh, shows that, that we did at TWP, and, and, and well, George was a, a terrific director and a teacher. Uh, there were some uh, spectacular failures uh, as well. Christopher Columbus was one that comes to mind. <laughs> Christopher Columbus was a show that we regularly played. Uh, we would start the evening off with eight people in the audience. <laughs> and then we would come out after intermission to four people. <laughs> and, that, and, that, and that's, you know, I think they probably like sort of like have a lottery in the, in the lobby. You know, it's really <laughs> You couldn't possibly leave us with only two people in the audience, you know, so we just have to like the same thing. Yes, I was talking to Alan about this before because you know, 10 lost years was actually a bit of a departure for George. Um, uh, his, his regular methods of working, the efforts and, and, and that, that kind of way of seeing your way through the material, People like, like Cedric and Jackie Burroughs and Patsy Ludwig uh, uh, and, and I guess Peter Faulkner who, who had sort of come back into the company. Uh, not so much those of us who were relatively new to George, but they had to actually practically headlock him into paring down the use of the physical work. And eventually we got to the point, I think uh, we were about to open in seven days, and 
we still had kind of cracked the key of the, of the show. And he came back, I guess maybe after a, a lunch with Cedric and a couple of people and said, okay, right, uh, we're just gonna sit and tell the stories. For the most part, that's what we did. Is any of this making any sense? <laughs> Okay, Ten Lost Years. <laughs> the book of Ten Lost Years was this collection of stories. For example, it, it, there's, there's music that goes along with this, but uh, here's, here's one story of, of, of somebody who was sitting in a bar, probably over a couple of draft beers, talking to Barry uh, uh, Broadfoot about his experience as a, as a hobo, riding back and forth across Canada during that ten years of the Depression, on top of boxcars, begging, grabbing jobs wherever you could, stealing food, passing information one hobo to the next about what was a good house to visit. If you go into such and such a town, and down to the right, and in the back of this house, the one with the green gable, they're really, really nice, but don't go to the place with the red front door, because, you know, they'll practically shoot you. <laughs> so people would gather by the, by the rail tracks outside of town in what were called Hobo jungles. So this is a story here. I saw one man kill another man one night in the jungle at Kamloops in British Columbia. It wasn't about food or money either. Let me tell you. One fella said Roosevelt was president of the United States, and another fella said it was Coolidge. Well, one thing led to another, and they always do, and the, Co the Roosevelt man grabbed the other fella and threw him. And he fell and hit his head on the iron arrangement we had to keep our pots over the fire. It appeared that the point end went into his ear. Anyway, it killed him, or, or so we thought so. It certainly appeared dead to me. The Roosevelt man took him up to the tracks, and uh, soon a freight train came along and squished his head to nothing. Uh, so where was your evidence? I reckon 50 men saw that killing if one saw it. To this day, that was a drunk laying asleep, his head on the rail. Anyway, that's that's one of the that's one of the stories. Up to you. Yeah, really. Thanks. <laughs> for career just tumbled, right? <laughs> you learn to crawl around on your hands and knees and look over your shoulders. Are you looking? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, I would never in a million years trade that experience that I had. It was incredible. If you guys ever get the opportunity to work in a company like that, grab it. Grab it. It just shapes your life. I'm sitting here listening to these stories. I lived them, I worked them, I did them, and I'm going, wow, is that ever interesting? <laughs> Where was I? <laughs> wow, that's fascinating stuff. Oh, hello. <laughs> we'll get that later. <laughs> It'll be a contest, the wild prize. from the whole experience is that first of all, we got the young company, got to work with very talented, experienced people. We learned so much, so much. You were constantly in awe, constantly wondering what the next jewel would be, the next gift that you would be given, the next experience. Traveling across the country, getting to see Canada, speaking the words of Canadians who had gone through the Depression, experiencing their feelings, their emotions, their love of the country. 
It was incredible taking this to Europe, watching the European reactions to Canadian theatre, Canadian material. Who gets that kind of experience now? We don't have theatre. What we have are productions, big productions. Lots of razzmatazz, big flashing lights, big flashing numbers. There isn't the heart, the soul, the imagination that is missing nowadays. We really need to get back to that awe as we were talking about a plain room, some people who have feelings, who have hearts, who have emotions, who can convey experiences that can connect with each individual person. That's what 10 Lost Years was. And it's really interesting because we're going back now into a depression, recession time. We're going to have new stories. But will they get told? This is a piece of history that I am so proud as a Canadian to be part of. What an amazing experience. It's something that was organic. It was something that happened in the right time, in the right place, with the right kind of people, with people who were willing to give of themselves. You didn't get paid very much at all. I mean, <laughs> actors are notorious, right? You go to a banquet. <laughs> <laughs> Fill your pockets, right? Oh, free, good. I mean, that's how you existed. But the experience of working with George and with the company is phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. And all I can say is that I wish you all that experience. I wish you all that opportunity to explore what you have, the gifts. The gifts that each and every one of you has here and the, the passion with which you want to pursue those gifts. Make sure, George was passionate. <laughs> Make sure you take that passion that you find inside you and be able to share that with the people. And make your own 10 lost years. And don't make them lost, make them found. <laughs> I have a George Luskin story. Right. It's a George Luskin story because after George left TWP and then the company subsequently folded in what was one of the most disgraceful episodes in Canadian theatre history, what they did to that man and to that company, um, George came and taught for us at the University of Guelph as a part-time instructor. We wanted him to direct shows, but he wouldn't. He refused because he said our students were not ready to go anywhere near a stage. But he would teach them what he could. And he taught for us for a number of years until he had a heart attack while teaching a story, a, a class at Guelph. And that ended his career. Uh, and he died about two years later. I was walking through the building and I'd stop and chat with him frequently and hear his stories. And George had a deep regard for the efforts in Laban and he was also had a very deep regard for Stanislavski and, and really melded these things. And I walked in I was walking through the, um, I had to go through his acting studio to go to the bathroom and because uh, of our facilities. And George was standing there. He would go into his classroom about half an hour before the students would arrive, always, and to spend time in that room. And I walked in one day and he was standing there and he was just glowing. He, I've never seen a happier face in my life. He was just glowing. And I said, George, what's, uh, what's up? And he said, Alan, he said, I finally got it. I finally got the magic if. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, he never stopped being a student. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I jump just a tiny little short story about, uh, he, he came over for dinner one night because we stayed really close and he actually followed my career as a director, giving me fierce notes every step of the way. <laughs> and he told me he was following my career because I understood.